Right now, bikes in the sub 1K category represent a huge leap forward in terms of geometry, spec, and performance compared to their counterparts from just a few years ago. And if these improvements on paper translate to better performance on the trails, it's great news for buyers on a budget. That said, for those who are new to the sport or those with not a huge budget, spending over a thousand pounds or dollars can be a daunting prospect. And even upping that budget just a little bit is even more scary. So if you're a beginner or you've been saving up by eating beans on toast for a year, you're going to want to get the maximum amount of performance for your cash. Although not commonplace at this price point, we are starting to see high performance parts trickle down into bikes at this price range, such as dropper seat posts, one by drivetrains, and other impressive kit. Most importantly, you can also expect to see modern geometry on modestly priced bikes. Testing happened in Scotland's Tweed Valley on my home trails at the Glen Tress Forest Trail Centre. This is also host to the UK's round of the Enduro World Series. So you can be sure that these bikes were really put through their paces. Of course, thanks to the coronavirus pandemic and other factors across the globe, finding a bike that's in stock at the moment is really hard. Hopefully when normality finally returns to our lives, this video will have put you in a great position to press the trigger on your dream steed. Let's kick off with bike number one, which is the 749.99 pound Vetus Nucleus VRS. As you'd expect from online retail giants, this bike from their in-house brand Vetus is well specced, including a 1x10 Shimano drivetrain, Tektro hydraulic disc brakes, and WTB rims, along with WTB Trail Boss and Vigilante tires. The SR Suntour XCR32 front fork sports a boost axle along with a compression slash lockout adjust lever. The boost axle improves front end stiffness, but also opens up the potential for upgrading front wheels with more choice. Unfortunately, the rear axle on the bike is a 9x135 quick release affair, which is a little at odds with the fork. The large size I tested has a ride calming 67 degree head angle, but a relatively short for size large 450mm reach figure. Now I tested the 29 inch wheel version that comes in medium, large and extra large sizes, but there is also a 27.5 inch wheel bike that has a small in its range of sizes too. Now that's a lot of bike for the cash, but how does it perform out on the trails? I found out. Although I had high expectations for the Nucleus, unfortunately the frame felt particularly stiff. Now this meant that bumps and vibrations were transmitted through the bike into my body whilst riding. On the climbs and on the flat, this was most apparent on high speed trail center style surfaces. This meant the bike struggled to smooth over that trail buzz, those little rough undulations. Instead, it transmitted all of that into my body. On the descents, this stiffness reduced traction, making the bike feel skittish at times. This was especially apparent when there were multiple successive hits in a row where control and stability was limited. I found the harsh feel of the rear end was compounded by the fork's lack of sensitivity. Increasing sag definitely helped, and this was easy to do by releasing air from the fork's air spring. And there was way too much rebound damping, even with the fork's dial set to fully open. And there was also quite a bit of stiction, and this dramatically reduced the fork's ability to absorb bumps. The Nucleus's geometry has a real cross-country bias, where the handlebars are positioned lower relative to the saddle compared to most modern trail bikes. This certainly helps keep the front wheel on the ground up steep climbs when you're seated. 
However, when you're standing and with relatively short reach, it does make the bike feel low and cramped. Heading downhill, the XC geometry and short feeling reach had me a long way over the front of the bike. This meant the handling was on the snappier side of playful. And as soon as speeds increased on the trails, I found a lot of care and attention needed to be taken to keep the bike in complete control. And that was despite the relatively slack 67 degree head angle. Whilst the Vitus looked almost perfect on paper, especially when you consider its price tag, there's no denying the geometry has led to a slightly compromised ride. Its spec, however, is pretty good, especially the drivetrain, but the fork and the brakes are a little compromised. What happens if you raise your budget to just a little bit below a thousand pounds? Well, I tested the Cannondale Trail SE4 to find out. Cannondale says the Trail SE4's dropped seat stay construction, which is dubbed Save Micro Suspension, helps improve comfort and reduce trail buzz thanks to specially designed portions of the chain and seat stays that are designed to flex. The internal cable routing and there's a port for a dropper seat post gives clean lines. The rear end has boost axle spacing, which also improves upgradability down the line. Spec highlights include a 1x10 Shimano Dior drivetrain, along with Shimano brakes and WTB breakout and trail boss tubeless ready tires. The coil sprung 120mm travel Suntour XCR fork also has boost axle spacing to match the rear end. For a 29er, the bike has a relatively slack 66.5 degree head angle. However, the reach is pretty short at 440 millimeters for the size large. In the case of the Cannondale, it seems like spending more money improves the amount of technology in the frame and also gives you more options for upgradability later on down the line. But what does that mean out on the trails? True to Cannondale's claims, the Trail SE has an overriding feeling of smoothness, and it's even possible to visibly see the rear end flexing when manipulated. Seated climbing is comfortable, and only a limited amount of bumps and vibrations are transmitted up into the rider. But you're still able to feel the trail. It certainly doesn't feel numb. On the descent, the Trail SE4 is equally as smooth. Its flex stays helping to create that same grippy feeling a soft but not underinflated tyre creates. This meant traction was abundant and it was easy to make the bike grip around turns. It also helped reduce fatigue, which meant I could ride for longer on the Canada. Although the Trail SE4 certainly has a more traditional cross-country shape, it was most suited to bridleway bashing and blue graded trail center runs. Thanks to its longish top tube and low down feeling front end, it has a fairly aggressive position when seated. However, when standing on the pedals, you feel much more upright on the bike. This is because of its short reach. Despite its sleek looks and potential upgradability, it will be the geometry that eventually limits what the Trail SE4 can do. That limit will probably be found towards the more extreme end of cross-country riding. However, that's no bad thing if cross-country is your type of riding. If you're going to be spending that extra bit of money on the Cannondale over the Vitus, it looks like that additional investment goes into the frame. Now, admittedly, breaking the thousand pound or dollar limit when looking to purchase a bike is definitely daunting. But if you can afford that increase, you'll get a bike that's more suited to rougher and more technical terrain and has more potential to be upgraded in the future. For £1,149, you'll be able to buy Specialized Fuse 275. And this is the next bike I'm going to be looking at. This is the Big S's most affordable hardcore trail hardtail and comes with wide 2.8 inch wide plus tires. There's a butcher at the front and a slaughter at the back. Although these run on 650B or 27.5 inch wheels, the frame is compatible with 29 inch hoops. 
The frame also has a rear boost axle, has a threaded 73 mm bottom bracket, has two bottle cage mounts on the inside of the front triangle, and its cables are routed internally from the head tube to the bottom bracket. It's fitted with a 1x11 Shimano Dior drivetrain and a 120mm travel Transex dropper seat post. Other kit includes a 120mm travel RockShop Judy air fork and Shimano MT200 disc brakes. The finishing kit is made up by a specialised in-house stout brand. Looking at the geometry, you can see why it's called a hardcore hardtail. It has a relatively slack 66 degree head angle and a 460 millimeter reach for the size large. All of the bikes in the range have a 74 degree seat tube angle. The Fuse 275 spec list and geometry should mean that it's a total hoot to ride out on the trails. I went to find out. I'm going to kick off with a negative point. Now this one might be prohibitive for some people, which is why it's important to start here. Now I personally struggled to get the front end of the Fuse 275 high enough for my preferences. I installed all of the supplied headset stem stackers underneath the stem. This meant the stem was as far up the steerer tube as it possibly could be, but it still didn't feel high enough. Although it would be possible to install a higher rise bar to help improve the height, the problem lies with the stack height that is pretty low for this bike. Although the aggressive over the front position is certainly a positive when seated going up steep climbs, it's not ideal for gnarly descents. Admittedly, on flatter trail center style riding, the low front end didn't slow me down one bit. This was especially the case once I'd increased fork pressure to help reduce sag and prop that front end up a bit more. In fact, at cruisy speeds on your average trail center run, this is a great, fun and composed bike to ride. And whilst I'll also admit it's not bad on steep descents, its limits are much easier and quicker to reach than other bikes I've ridden. The limited stack height meant that my weight was pitched forward much easier than I was hoping, and it was certainly trickier to stay central and balanced on the bike. Ultimately, and it's certainly worth saying this, the 27.5 inch wheeled fuse is held back by its stack height. However, there is a 29 inch wheeled model in the range that has slightly different geometry with bigger wheels and an increased stack height. It does cost quite a bit more money though, retailing for £1,599. Having said all of that, the Fuse 27.5 is not a bad bike by any means. Against other models from other brands in this price category, the Fuse 275 is great fun, and it's awesome to hustle around trail center loops. Its parts work well together, and as a whole package, it feels really refined, but won't break the bank. In my opinion, if you're able to stretch your finances that little bit further, you will be pleasantly surprised. I've reviewed the Merida Big Trail 500 which retails for £1,350 and is an absolute bruiser on the trail, despite its relatively diminutive price tag. It has a 65.5 degree head angle, which is pretty slack for a 29er. This slack head tube angle is mated to a relatively steep seat tube angle, and the seat tube length is pretty short. The short seat tube and low top tube height mean that it's possible to size up from your normal preference. For example, for the big trail, I went for an XL when I'd normally be a large. Sizing up like this should help improve performance for both beginners and experienced riders. For that price tag, you get a frame that's built from the Reader's 61 aluminium with double butted tubes and impressively smooth welds. Cables are routed internally through the frame, and the rear end has a boost axle. It runs on 29 inch wheels, and there's clearance for 2.5 inch wide tires. It's fitted with Shimano's 1x11 Dior group set that has the same 51 tooth lowest sprocket as their more expensive 12 speed drivetrain. 
It's fitted with Tektro's M275 disc brakes and is fitted with Maxxis Dissector tires. There's also a 150mm Travel Merida branded dropper post. Up front, there's a RockShox Recon Silver RL fork with 150mm of travel. It uses an air spring and has externally adjustable rebound and compression damping. While the Big Trail 500 is certainly impressive on paper, especially its geometry and spec, what does this mean out on the trails? Does it have a faultless ride? Well, thanks to its 475mm reach figure for the XL, there's plenty of room to move around on the bike when standing up attacking climbs. This makes it possible to control how much grip either the front or rear tyres of the bike have with incredibly deliberate movements. As a result, there's less chance of losing grip at the back wheel and wheel spinning, and in turn overweighting that front wheel. It's a similar story when climbing seated. Thanks to that steeper seat tube angle positioning your hips further towards the front of the bike, seated climbing is a comfortable and controlled affair. Overall, I'd certainly say the Big Trail is an incredibly competent climber. For me, the biggest niggle about the Big Trail is its chainstay design. When I was pedaling, I found that the insides of my feet were clipping the seat stays on every rotation. This is because the seat stays bow out just before the rear axle. Although this was initially pretty frustrating, it wasn't hard to modify my foot position on the pedals to stop them clipping the seat stays. And all of that was forgotten as soon as I hit a grin inducing descent. The Recon Fork impressed me and it has great bump munching abilities. This created an incredibly controlled and comfortable ride. To boot, it had plenty of mid stroke support and bottom out resistance, which was something that I wasn't expecting on a low end fork. And that's really where the Big Trail shines. There's nothing frantic about the way the Big Trail descends. It's entirely possible to maintain an impressively neutral and composed position on the bike and I felt no need to lean backwards and push myself off the rear of it to compensate for compromised geometry. On the sort of descent where you'd expect a £1,000-ish hardtails limits to show, the Merida truly shines. In my opinion, the Big Trail 500 rides similarly to a short travel full suspension trail bike on the types of trails where you'd usually get into a pickle. Overall, the Big Trail 500 has to be one of the most composed and controlled hardtails out there for the money. Just make sure you pick the right size. Take a good long look at Merida's geometry chart because the size names don't necessarily correspond to the size that you would normally ride. It's certainly true that there are loads of great bikes out there at the moment to suit a host of different riding styles and trail types. There are loads that I also haven't mentioned in this video. Please let us know what your favorite trail hardtail is by leaving a comment. And as ever, don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that little bell icon so you get a notification every time we upload a new video.